My name is Doug Roth, um, and today's presentation will be about inflation. Um, I worked on this presentation along with Austin and Kieran, who was not able to make it today. Um, but we have a lot of goals that we intend to get out of the presentation itself today. And really the agenda for today is first of all to kind of define inflation for you guys. Inflation has been kind of a hot topic over the past few years. Um, and it's been coined around in the news and the media for the past few years. Um, so we want to kind of give you guys a general definition of what that means. Um, go through kind of the kind of inflation, how inflation is measured, um, and kind of refer back to, again, why inflation has been returned within the media for the past few years, how high inflation has been affecting us. Um, thirdly, we're going to talk about the causes of inflation, why inflation occurs, the types of inflation, and how different types are caused by different factors. Um, and then Austin will be talking about the wages, our wages, and how, inflation, how, how they have been reacting to the increase in inflation in the past few years. Um, and then he will talk about monetary policy in regards to reducing inflation. And finally, how inflation affects you guys as students. So to begin, I want to start with this infographic, which kind of gives you a general idea of what inflation actually is. Um, if you see, this is not like realistic numbers in the sense I've never seen a cup of coffee for two dollars, but you know, it, it gives you a general idea of how inflation is actually something that is gradual. It does not happen overnight, and, and most people are kind of numb to the fact that inflation occurs in their actual life because it happens so slowly. Um, if you ask people who are older than you, much like your parents or your grandparents, they'll tell you a lot about how, oh, I used to shop for groceries for less than $10 back in my day. Now you, you go to the grocery store, you're not walking out at least with 30 bucks out of your pocket. So, so it shows you how much your money is decreasing in today's terms in comparison to what it was in the past. So to kind of go through inflation and kind of describe inflation to you, inflation really represents a rise in prices or a decrease in purchasing power. I think rise in prices is quite self-explanatory, but what does purchasing power mean? Does anyone know? Purchasing. How much your money's worth? Correct. Um, by definition, purchasing power is how much your money's worth in terms of product. How much one unit of currency can buy you in terms of product? If we go back to the previous slide, you can see that one dollar could have bought you four coffees back in 1970. That same one dollar in 2000 only buys you one coffee. That purchasing power has decreased by 75%. It went from three, four to one. So your purchasing power is how much one unit of currency can buy you in terms of product. Um, when inflation rises, your purchasing power decreases. That means your money is less valuable to you. But also that, well, that also means that your cost of living is increasing. Your money that you're making, if it's not growing as much as inflation, life is becoming more expensive for you and you are saving less over time. Um, a third thing about inflation is that it slows economic growth, which I think is self-explanatory in that if you are making less money, you have less money to spend, then businesses can get less money out of you, which slows economic growth. Um, and then I want to talk to you guys about how inflation is commonly measured here in the US. We have two types of indexes, which are the CPI and PPI. The CPI is the consumer price index, and that reflects the change in price from one time period to another time period of a basket of necessity goods. Necessity goods could be food, energy, healthcare services, clothing, rent, all these things that most consumers in the US are buying on a monthly basis. You can't live without food, you can't live without rent, and so on and so forth. So how much are those prices changing from month to month, year over year? And when you see a drastic change, you're seeing that these prices of these things for consumers are growing up. That means cost of living is increasing. That means if wages are not increasing at the same rate, you are becoming poorer in a sense. The producer price index is a similar index, but it's actually for producers. Producers are making products for to sell in the economy, for example, but the basket of goods for producers is actually raw material inputs. 
For example, that would be your cotton, your oil, your wheat. Anything that you use to refine and make into a finished product, that is a raw material input. And when those costs increase, prices of those products increase, which also cause inflation. I want to go through this slide, which kind of is a graph of the PPI and CPI trends over the past 10 or 12 years. If you can see, the CPI and PPI recently have been really high. I know this stops at September 21, but that's where it peaked. Um, and you can see that PPI is almost at 10% and CPI is at 8%. The reason why CPI is not equal to PPI is that sometimes when costs of production go up for producers, for companies, they do not always want to reflect those costs into their products. So for example, if you have, if you're purchasing an article of clothing of which the cotton prices had increased by 10%, that article of clothing might increase five, 6%, but definitely not 10%. It might not increase at all. It's based on the discretion of the producer. And so the goal is to minimize the effect of those input costs on you, the consumer. And that's why the CPI is generally less than the PPI in a sense. Um, so before we go into the, the cost of inflation, I want to kind of walk you guys through the variety of inflation types and because they all have different causes. So the most, you know, the, the general type of inflation is your built-in inflation. And what that means is that wages and the prices are growing at a constant rate. They're both growing equally. That means that if my, my wage is going up by 10%, the prices of materials or, or goods that I buy is also going by 10%. And what happens, what that does, it makes that my purchasing power does not decrease over time. My purchasing power stays the same as much as it was the year ago or two years ago. Of course, prices increase, but your wages also increase, so you don't feel that the, you don't feel the change in prices. Um, the second variety is cost push inflation. Cost push inflation is when there is a spike in the prices of cost inputs for producers. For example, when OPEC about a month ago decided that they are going to cut the supply of oil and the price per barrel of oil spiked to over $90, that caused inflation because it causes any product that oil is used in to also go up in price. For example, if you go to fill up gas, if you went to fill up gasoline, at that time, we would have seen that the price per gallon was right around $3.40, $3.50, when in usual now it's about $3.20, depending on where you go. So when your cost of inputs increase, your price per product also increases, which causes inflation. The demand pull inflation is different in a sense because it's kind of a two-step process. Um, it's caused by an increase in money supply within the economy. When you have more money in the economy, you have consumers have more money and they have more demand for, for products that they usually did not have demand for. A great example for this is when the government began to print excess money during the pandemic and people were given stimulus checks, they were given unemployment checks. That increased their money, that increased how much demand they had for a variety of items that they did not have demand for in the, in before, the, before they received the excess cash. What happens there is that demand increases, but the supply of the economy for those products is, does not react fast enough. And if you guys see here, when the supply stays stagnant, but demand increases, it forces your prices to go up because there's more demand for those products. Um, and a great example I have for that is when for example, when the PS5s were released, I remember there was limited quantity for how much they, they had produced and the, the logistics of getting them out was very difficult. So they had limited quantity, but there was so much demand for them that those PS5s were reselling in the aftermarket for like two grand, three grand a piece. That's what, when you have a mismatch between supply and demand and demand spikes like rapidly, your prices also increase rapidly. The cost, flaw, the cost push effect in the sense is when your prices go up, your supply, your supply line goes to the left because you have less supply per, you have less, less quantity per price, and that increases your price again. So those are two examples of what inflation is. Um, you see, I didn't put a graph for 
built-in inflation because built-in inflation is the optimal region. You see that when you have increase in wage, but the prices do not, but the supply does not increase, you have inflation. When supply decreases, but you're, I mean, when so, when so, when the price, well, I'm sorry, when you have an increase in wage, but your prices remain stagnant, demand increases and it pulls the prices upwards and it causes inflation. Um, when you have a price increase, but the wages don't stay the same, you have, um, what's it called? You, it, pu it pushes the price of the product upwards and it creates inflation. So the optimal solution is that for both prices and wages to increase and that way the, you never feel like your purchasing power is decreasing and that's how a healthy economy survives. All right, what's up guys, I'm Austin. Yeah, I'm gonna be going over uh, how wages react to inflation. So the short answer, it depends on how much wages are increasing compared to the rate of inflation. If wages are rising faster than inflation, then you will realize a higher purchasing power and the effect of inflation won't be as apparent because you are making uh, more money. In actuality, wages are one of the last incomes to rise compared to inflation and cost of living standards. As you all have seen in your day-to-day -day lives, your wages do not increase or rarely increase at the rate comparative to that of inflation, at least for our age groups. As we all have seen in the past couple of years, items in the Consumer Price Index, the CPI, such as gas and grocery prices, have all increased substantially from the price that they were a few years ago. But even with these price increases, most of us have seen stagnant wages. As a side note, as we already know, the CPI is best described by the Bureau of Wage Statistics as a measure of the average change over time in the prices paid by urban consumers for a market basket of goods. That being said, there are some remedies to the situation. The federal, state, and local governments have the power to increase the minimum wage, which can help preserve the buying power of those in the labor market. But this generally takes time, and like I previously said, wages are typically the last component that rises. For example, in Maryland a few years ago, they enacted a minimum wage increase from, I think it was $11.10 to $15 an hour. This wage increase is expected to be fully enacted by January of 2024. But what about the workers that make more than minimum wage? How do they not suffer from the effects of inflation? There is more ambiguity with employees who make more than minimum wage, such as those on salary. To not, to not suffer, generally, employees, employers will offer raises, or some employers will offer cost of living adjustments, known as COLAs, to the salaries or wages of employees to help them obtain their compensation against inflation. Basically, their salaries or wages increase comparatively to inflation. The government can also intervene with monetary and fiscal policy, which we will discuss in the next slide. So, monetary policy. Uh, basically, it's like when the Federal, uh, government, the federal Reserve uh, intervenes with, um, in the economy. Like, for example, they can buy and sell bonds to interject or take out money from the, uh, the market. And then they can, uh, you know, implement it by yeah, implement by the Federal Reserve, controls the money supply. And then we have the uh, FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, meets every quarter and sets the federal funds rate, with, where banks then change their interest rates to consumers in order to meet the expensiveness or cheapness of the federal funds rate. And then uh, interest rate is somewhat pricey as inflation is extremely high, so borrowing is much more expensive and decreases the amount people want to spend on goods and services. And I think right about now, our current interest rates are about 5.33%. And we have a short video on this as well. Uh -huh. On its highest rate in 40 years, the Federal Reserve is expected to raise interest rates several times in 2023. <coughs> this is Fed Chairman Jerome Powell on what will be needed to ensure a long economic expansion. That's going to require the Fed to tighten interest rate policy and do our part in getting inflation back down to our 2% goals. The way the central bank does this is by changing the federal funds rate, its main tool for managing the economy. You can see on this chart that the rate was lowered to nearly 0% in 2020 to boost the economy at the beginning of the pandemic. There is an important job for us to move away from these very highly stimulative monetary policy settings. Adjustments to the federal funds rate includes a range of borrowing costs, from how much you own your credit card to mortgage rates. They also shape broader decisions made by companies, like how many people to hire or whether to raise prices. 
here's how the federal funds rate works and how just one rate can guide the entire economy. The Fed meets every six or so weeks, and they're looking at a range of economic data at those meetings, but they have two main goals. One is to ensure stable prices and low inflation, and the other is to make sure that the labor market is strong. Nick Timrose tells how the Fed guides the economy through crisis. He says you can think of the economy as a car and the Fed as the driver. They want to make sure that the economy is not growing too slow, and when it is, they'll push on the gas. But they also want to make sure that it's not going too fast, and so they'll slow the economy down by pressing on the brake. This is where the federal funds rate comes in. When you hear on the news about the Fed raising interest rates or cutting interest rates, what they're actually deciding to do is to raise or to lower the federal funds rate. This is the interest rate that banks charge each other to borrow money overnight. But there's a catch. The federal funds rate isn't directly set by the Federal Reserve. So in order to influence it, the Fed uses a couple of other tools to set a target range. These tools are rates that the Fed controls in its role as a bank for banks. Here's the target range that was in place during 2021. The Federal Reserve sets an upper limit and a lower limit, with the goal of keeping the effective federal funds rate somewhere in between. The upper limit is determined by interest on reserve balances. This is the rate of interest a bank gets on deposits, known as reserves, that it keeps at the Federal Reserve. The lower limit is determined by overnight diverse repurchases. These are securities, like treasury bills, that the Federal Reserve lends to banks, usually for a day, while paying interest. On this chart, you can see where the Fed has set the target range between the two yellow lines. The blue line, which is the effective federal funds rate set by banks, sits between the upper and lower limits. As the target range changes, the effective rate goes up or down with it. So far, they've had very successful control over guiding the federal funds rate and guiding all short-term money market rates to where they generally are trying to move them. The Fed makes these adjustments in fairly small increments. Its rate increases for 2022 are expected to only change by about a quarter to half of a point at a time. So how can these tiny adjustments for banks help cool down the entire economy? It all has to do with how those rates ripple through the system. As banks are charged more to borrow, they'll in turn charge their customers more, affecting the cost of existing loans and demand for new borrowing. The goal of raising these rates is to drive down demand. Inflation results when supply and demand are out of whack. The Fed can't do anything to increase the supply of oil or to increase the number of houses for sale. The supply side is something out of their reach. But they can bring supply into the balance by reducing demand. Here's how interest rates can influence demand and inflation. When rates are low, more people and businesses are likely to take out loans. Higher demand for goods and services, as well as lower rates, allows employers to open more positions to meet demand and raise wages to appeal to potential employees. Consumers then turn around and spend those wages on goods and services, which in turn can lead to more jobs and higher prices. The opposite happens when rates are higher. Fewer people and businesses take out loans, job growth slows, and spending decreases. Higher interest rates may also make it more appealing to save. Inflation slows as supply and demand balance out. While interest rates can be effective in bringing inflation down, a rate hike can take some time to make an impact. Think about your own life as you go through making different decisions about whether to buy a house and how big of a house to buy. It may take a while for this to, to ripple through the housing market, for example. But in six or 12 months, we could begin to see um, you know, the less demand if interest rates are high enough to slow interest to consumers. But while inflation may take time to come down, consumers and businesses will likely feel the impact of higher interest rates on loans, mortgages, and credit cards right away. With inflation covered on Fiscal policy, definitely a lot more straightforward than monetary policy. 
It's basically done when Congress or the president decides to either interject more money or take out money from the economy. And I like to think of this like pretty simply. It's basically like when they, if the government wanted to make more purchases, you know, buy more trucks from Ford or say, or maybe put more jobs in the, in the market by like fixing up roads or such at or whatever, honestly. So uh, definitely more straightforward. And direct uh, also direct that with taxes as well. So um, currently more favorable right now due to economic downturn moving. It may also vary based on political ideology of the government, either liberal or conservative. And then political stagnation due to polarization and politics the economy you can also like mess with the fiscal, fiscal policy as well. But then, all, yeah, like I said, it was talking about your taxes as well. So if obviously if they wanted to put more money in, they'd cut taxes. If they wanted to take money out, they would raise the taxes. And then how this affects you. So, you know, both are extremely important and relevant to your personal income. Uh, political knowledge is also extremely important here as well. Knowing what type of political administration is coming in and out of the government is critical. With high inflation, the government is primed to stop any recession. So interest rates are not extremely high, nor are all forms of taxes. Student loans are directly affected by both, which we can all relate to, and can increase or decrease the amount of money you pay back in the future. So based on your loans off that. And then, um, you know, what do all of this means? So, I mean, we pretty much explained everything today, but uh, whatever the federal government does, it's extremely important to you and student loans. Um, inflation will definitely affect your buying power and the quantity of products and services that you can purchase during your lifetime. So it's very important to learn about inflation and the effects it has on you. And that's about it. Does anyone have any uh, questions? No? All right, well, that's it.